green recording. So, I don't... Has anyone done Drupal 8 theming yet? Drupal 7 theming. So you all know the basics of what theming is. A little bit about me. As I said, first few slides, unimportant. That's a recent theme I worked on with North Studio. It, it looks good, for most people anyways. I didn't design it because I suck as a designer, but I'm good at actually doing the implementation. So, what I want from this session, well, what I want for you guys to get from this session is that you can convert a new theme from an old Drupal 7 theme, or 6, 6 to 7 there, close enough, it's extendable the knowledge you have. Or you can create a new theme, or modify an existing theme, or just theme a single component, whether it's in a module or in a theme, because you can do theming in the module if you're creating a new component. And the most different thing for me when I started learning Drupal 8 theming was the asset library. So we're going to divide it into a few sections. First, the actual building blocks of a theme. Drupal theming should definitely be accessible. There's many themes that aren't. That is a problem, I think. Yes, Drupal core is very accessible, but your theme controls a lot of that. So try and make it accessible. Run it through accessibility checkers. It just helps your user base actually be everyone, not a small section. Should be navigable. Obviously, otherwise, how are people going to access the content? It should also only concern itself with the front end. It shouldn't be creating forms, except for there's one form that should create if you are doing a complicated theme, and that's for controlling the theme itself. All your other forms should be in modules or config. There's five primary languages in Drupal 8 as opposed to Drupal well, 7. Drupal 8 has HTML, same as 7, or basically any other language format, and for the templates, it's Twig instead of PHP template. That's the big change for the Drupal 8 theming in terms of templating. It sounds like a big change maybe, but it really, you're using the same concepts you're just applying it slightly differently. Then CSS and JavaScript, you should already be familiar with that if you've been doing design or interaction aspects of the theme. Then PHP, same as already was around. And YAML, that's uh, basically markup to give it information. There are some things you can do with modules and that you can't do with themes, and vice versa. Well, anything you can do in a theme, you can do in a module, but you maybe shouldn't. Pre-process functions, you can do it in both. Unless you really have a good reason, it's usually better to put the pre-process functions in your theme. Maybe you ha want to have that preprocess function in your module because you're going to do that specific component in multiple different sites. Then that's fine. But otherwise, just keep it in your theme. Templates, both. But again, unless it's being reused, keep it in your theme. Your asset library, same difference. Hooks, like in Drupal 7, we have theme hooks. And those, unfortunately, vary whether you can use them in themes or modules or both. And you basically have to look at the source code for when that hook is called, which is a good use for the api.drupal.org. Then, now we get into actual content that you probably care about. 
what are the differences? So, theme name dot info, it's gone. It's now replaced by dot info dot yml. That's the new YAML format that I was talking about. It also uses a few other files for the YAML. The libraries, which is how you get in JS and CSS, and breakpoints. Personally, I haven't ever felt the need to use breakpoints. I use breakpoints in my CSS. That's good enough. I understand there are advanced uses, but I don't know them, so I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, can everyone somewhat read that? Here's a oh, YAML file. As you can see, can you see? Uh, okay, so it's pretty simple. It's just key value pairs. And then you have sequences, which is basically a PHP array with numbered keys. That's just a dash and then a value, dash and a value. Or you can have a map. That's a PHP associated array. Well, it is once Drupal reads it, it becomes one. That's a, you indent two spaces. You could indent four spaces, but the standard is two spaces. Then another key value pair. And you can even have it go another two spaces after that to have this one is an array within an array. And then here's two existing themes. You may have heard of the Neato theme. It's a base theme. It's fairly common. Here's the old Drupal 7 version. And then there's the Drupal 8 version. You can see it's, it's the same content. It's just structured slightly differently. Basically, instead of equals, we got columns. <coughs> and the theme engine is not required to be specified in Drupal 8. It's going to be Twig unless you're using custom theme engine, so there's no need to specify it. You still do need to specify the core version compatibility, and that's usually 8.x and your regions. One difference is you could specify settings in Drupal 7 in the info. And now you don't. You specify it the same as with a module, which is in config, install, and schema. And then for defining an asset, you using that same YAML format, to just give it an uh, asset name, like Drupal.bootstrap. That's the name that you then refer to it later to add all of those assets in and dependencies. It provides dependency management and any combination of assets in one line that you then use later. The uh, name is in this file is not actually what you use when you call it. You use the name of both the module or theme that's providing it slash the name in this file. It's namespaced. And a few other key differences. It's a lot better for performance in Drupal 8 in the terms of the front end. As a lot of you probably know, the back end, well, it's got a lot more functionality. It takes a bit more time if you don't have good caching and setup. But on the front end, the basic out of the box is better because it only adds the CSS and JavaScript that you expressly tell it to put in, not jQuery on every page, unless you need jQuery on every page. And for a lot of designers, you're going to like using the CSS better in Drupal 8 because the core setup is already BEM and SMAXified. It's not exactly BEM or exactly SMAX, but on that theory. And they've also switched to HTML5 instead of HTML because HTML5 is the standard now. Why not use the standard? And 
now then, theme inheritance. Themes you might have noticed are the, the Nito theme, that it says base theme colon classy. The classy theme is one of the core themes in Drupal 8 that just ships with core. That provides you inheritance, which means that Nito has everything that Classy has in terms of templates and CSS, unless it overrides it. If it overrides it, great. It's as if it didn't exist. But it provides that base stuff so that you don't have to worry about it. It's generally recommended that you inherit from Classy for all your custom themes. You don't have to. You could inherit from Nito. It's often used as a base theme, but that is actually still inheriting from Classy because inheritance can have multiple levels. There are some things that aren't inherited from the base theme, though. That's settings, color module support, features, and region definitions. The region definitions, in most cases, you want those region definitions, so you copy and paste them from the parent theme, just directly into the info.yml. Anyone have any questions about the info.yml or base setup? Twig is an external program in an external project instead of the PHP template, which was a Drupalism. So Twig switch is good for supporting developers coming in from other projects. It's also a lot safer. By default, if you're rendering it with Twig, all of the user-entered content is being escaped. So it almost removes the possibility for any dangers there. It doesn't fully because you can force it to, to be dangerous, but it, uh, it makes you aware that you are doing something dangerous. You basically have to tell it to put in raw content. There are automated methods to convert it. I haven't used either of them. All my conversions, I've been doing other changes anyway, so I put them side by side. What was the old one? What do I want the new one to look? Because often you're doing an upgrade, you're going to do some changes in structure as well as in just the straightforward version. And here's a template. Is that legible at all? Kind of hard. Very hard to see. So, in Twig, you just have a double black, double curly braces tells it to render something, a variable. The same variable that you would print in a PHP template by saying print, then PHP variable. So, it's quicker. You are only putting two characters and then the variable name and then the end brackets. Which is, it's nice, but whatever. You get used to print, so it's not a big difference. And you should be able to figure out that that's pretty easy to, you can search and replace that even. Slightly uh, more complicated is the variable setting that you're not using in PHP anymore so you have to say any function that you're doing with twig is going to be starting with a curly brace and then a percent sign ending with a percent sign and a curly brace instead of PHP tags if you're just printing it's the two curly braces starting and ending and then for setting a variable you would <coughs> say set variable name equals whatever value you want. Well, that value is another variable, that's fine. You can also modify variables somewhat in Twig. Twig prevents you from using a full set of variable modification. Like, you can't just say uppercase this with your PHP function. If you want to use a function in Twig, it has to be available in Twig as a filter such as length. 
length is one of the built-in twig filters. It just tells you what the length of the ray is or the length of the string. It's the equivalent to count. Twig tweak is a very handy Drupal module that lets you do things like render a block or render a view within your Twig template without going through a pre-process function to create the block and then print it in your Twig because Twig can't get the view by default. Here's some common Twig filters. The one that I personally use most is the without key because you can then render half of your content from your node in one section of your con twig and then specific keys like uh, here's a block template so ooh, if I wanted to instead of rendering <coughs> my whole block content in the one div I could say content without field XYZ and then below it say div class field and put field xyz there. Twig can also be inherited, which if you look at a lot of the core templates, they have in the individual template, they have multiple blocks, which is the curly brace, percent sign block, and then some identifier. Do you think we can turn off the, um, some of those lights? Do we, does yeah. we know if we can? That yeah. Would, that would make it easier to see. I <laughs> think the front set, probably. Front set. Ah, So, uh, here's where it's naming a block. You don't have to override the whole template. You can just import this template say extends paragraph dot html dot twig. The namespace doesn't matter. All you need is the actual name of the template because Drupal puts all of the twig files that it finds into one big bag for extending. And then you just give the same name for your block and then you put your variables inside that. So you could some templates like this one, it's not very big. It has one block in it. Extending it provides minimal benefit. If you're extending a complicated template with six blocks in it, you're suddenly saving a lot of, of re code review when you just know you're extending the core template. And you don't have that size in your reading every time. Asset attachment. There's a lot of ways you can attach assets. They're all usable, but a lot of people, if you're coming straight, if you're porting a Drupal 7 theme, an easy thing to do will be just to attach it within the, the info.yml as libraries key in that, and then you give it names of libraries with that. PHP array syntax in of just the dash, then the library name. And there's what it would look like in the definition file, which is libraries.yml. You could have way more than that, but that gets you started, and then you can refactor it once you've done the first initial port, so that's actually following Drupal 8 standards of having specific CSS is attached to specific blocks within your content. You can also attach assets via preprocess functions. That's ideal. It lets you attach just what to CSS you need. It well, so say you don't have specific templates for each node type. Do a preprocess function and only attach the CSS you need. If you do have specific templates but you don't already have a preprocess function, don't bother creating a preprocess function. Just render it within the Twig template using the attach library function. This 
template also shows a couple of other functionalities with Twig and a slight complicated point. If you notice at the top, it has a field being printed for <coughs> value, which then has a square brackets. The reason it has the square brackets is you can't use the hashtag as the start of a key within the Twig language. But you can in PHP arrays. So if you're accessing any value in a render array that starts with a square, with, which starts with a hashtag, you have to use square brackets and then treat it as a string instead of using dot syntax. And here's a, a full asset library. So as you see, you can have multiple CSS files. You can have external CSS files. You can have multiple dependencies. Again, they're all the dependencies are coded as an array. You might notice that the actual CSS files are not an array. Well, they're a map. They're going as a PHP associative array. And even if you aren't specifying any details about the CSS file, you still have to give the CSS file path. The path is in relation to your libraries.yml. So if you uh, have a file that's not within your themes directory, you will have to give it the full relative path. And then after your theme, after your CSS or JavaScript file, you can provide it information in the form of curly braces. You have to put an empty curly brace after each file just to tell it that that's the end of the definition. But you can also give it the same in browser information that you could in Drupal add JS functionality in Drupal 7. A, the browser fun conditional the browser conditional rendering of JavaScript and CSS, it's poorly documented within the Drupal documentation because it's an Internet Explorer and Edge specific feature that it's falling out of fashion because Internet Explorer is finally, finally dying. But it's still a lot of universities especially require you to support Internet Explorer 8 at least. Some of them still want Internet Explorer 6 though, please, no, please. And you can also tell it that you want it to use an external font. For external, oops, okay. come on, scroll, new. Anyway, it's uh, here. For an external file, you have to tell it that it is an external asset by telling it type external after the file name. Even though it starts with HTTPS, you still have to spe specify that it is external. Or otherwise, it will get rendered wrong. Drupal 8 is fairly smart in its sorting. You don't really care what order things are in in your asset definitions because it will actually, if you see this, it has a dependency of LCOE responsive tabs. The definition for responsive tabs is lower down, but it still works because it gets all of the <laughs> files first and then and calculates dependencies when it actually renders it. Browser conditionals. This is the best definition for the browser conditionals, and that's only within the Drupal code base, not anywhere in the documentation. So yes, it's documentation, but you're not, never going to find this in the code base unless you know where to look, because it's 
on the HTML tag rendering <laughs> comments. Not in the CSS or JS processing, but in the HTML tag, because CSS and JS processing just says, this is a new HTML tag, and here, there's a browser array on it, but no comments about what are valid values for it. So, if you dig down, the HTML tag provides the details for this. A nice thing you can do is, this HTML tag, it works on any attribute, well, uh, any tag type. So you can you know, apply browser conditionals to a div. It works, <coughs> it's how Internet Explorer expects it, but the, uh, there's no documentation for it. It just works. And here's a preprocess function that it, everything in it, this is actually just run through Drupal module upgrader. Drupal module upgrader is a Drush uh, Drupal 8 module. It only works with Drush 8, not 9. That you can run a Drush command and automatically update a module. For, it will work on a theme, but you actually have to provide it the path in the command line. So it's not as easy for a theme, but it works fine. It won't do everything. It'll just do your info dot uh, theme name to info dot yml, and then it will also do your theme file. And well, it did something, but as you see, there's a fix me comment variable get. Variable get is gone. So you have to actually use the configuration management. But everything else? That's staying the same there. If you were trying to add JavaScript though or CSS, you can't do that. You have to do it through the attachments array or on a preprocess function. Or, well, you can illegally do it with an HTML tag somewhere, but don't do that, that'll mess up. Because if you ever reorder CSS or JavaScript, then you have the old thing of jQuery is no longer available, now my JavaScript doesn't work. So. Best practices, use your themes for things that are site specific. If it's going to be used on multiple sites, split it out into a module. The module can do everything that the theme can. But don't put your site specific stuff into a module. Twig is more secure. You don't have to worry about it. You can just print out your user en entered content. You can also do it dangerously if you want using the raw filter, but probably don't. So there are three ways you can create a theme. You can use Drupal console, which has a nice little generator. Depending on your setup, you may have to do the full path to Drupal console, which is usually vendor bin Drupal. If you're using Composer, it may be a level up. It will ask you a bunch of questions. What's your theme name? What's your machine name? Do you want to generate regions? Gives you an option to just enter your region. Next, enter your region. It, it's helpful if you don't know what you're doing. Personally, I rarely use it. I can type into a YAML file quicker than I can type in, press enter, type in, press enter. You can also use You can also use Drush. Drush, it's great, but I don't like its generation function as much. It will only generate the theme file, and then you have a separate 
command to generate settings, which uses the uh, proper Drupal config process. Oddly, Drupal console does not have an option to generate a settings file for Drupal 8 for the theme. So you can use both even, because as long as you provide the same machine name, it will know what you to target an existing theme. So here's what Drush generates. It just generates a theme with some sample preprocess functions. Then if you run the settings generation, it provides you with a settings PHP that gives you a form on the system theme page. And it also provides you your settings YAML, which is the new way of putting in your settings. If you're familiar with Drupal module development or with continuous integration, you've probably seen a lot of these. And you also have a schema which tells what kind of value each setting requires. Whereas it, with Drupal console, it generates you a little YAML file with the base theme, which it also lets you select which base theme and give it names of libraries for including on every page, and regions. And then it provides a similar base theme file with some alters and preprocess functions telling you what kind of things you can do. It provides a bit more examples, so I prefer for if you don't know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, generating it, it's not a lot of boilerplate, it doesn't really matter. I love the Drupal console generate functions for plugins because that's a lot of boilerplate. You also, with the Drupal module upgrade, here's an old file. This is before running it through a Drupal module upgrade. And then after, it's done everything. It hasn't done it all correctly because this doesn't exist anymore. You have to actually put that in the library's YAML, this whole section. That doesn't exist. It doesn't handle it smartly. It doesn't know everything. Regions? Regions are fine. Settings, though, that whole settings thing, that can't be there. It doesn't do anything. That would go in your settings.yaml within your config directory. Unfortunately, with uh, Drupal 8 themes, there is an important function that you can't really use. You can't use the plugin system or any of the Drupal 8 namespacing. You can get around it, but it's difficult. So generally, you don't have a source folder within a theme. It, this theme has a source folder because I have a Drush 9 command which uses the source folder. Drush 9 right now actually doesn't support having commands within the themes because it's using Drupal's theme loading, which doesn't load the namespaces from within themes. I do have a patch in, but that's under discussion about how best to do it. And some people don't want it, even though you could do it in Drupal 8. So I don't know if that's going to actually land or not. So did anyone have any questions? Well, did anyone want to start writing their own theme?
I think I drastically overestimated how much time I had on those slides <laughs> because that easily fit in an hour and this was supposed to be two and hours with a break in the middle. So um, I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> <laughs> So, come on, someone have a question about a theme. Hey, Owen. So, like, if we're building things as components, how would you, through Drupal 8, like in the YAML file or something, specify, let's just load this CSS file when this paragraph component is loaded, or yeah, okay. some sort of structure like that, we can specify the CSS per path or use? So, you can specify it in a there are a number of ways. If you look at this library here, I have some there's per paragraph. Like this. That's only applied to multi you can guess from the name, that's only applied to a multi-column paragraph. That that name doesn't actually do anything in this situation. This is just the th definitions for the CSS files. So when I use this library later, it gets you. Can you make the text any bigger on that, Jen? I don't know. Is it PHP Store? Is there a, a, a presenter mode or something? Mm -hmm. Down at the bottom of that. Right, right. Yes. Presentation mode. I think that feels bigger. Yeah. Much. You lose something. Though. Yes. Now I don't have. So I kind of need. Maybe you just need to review. Uh, uh, command one. Is it? Reopen the sidebar to Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a lot more legible. So you have these multiple different definitions for asset libraries. And, and do each of those um, map basically to a component? Is that the idea? That's the idea. The, the assets for a component? Yeah. Okay. This, this, this here is direct mapping, but it actually has no effect. What you do here you have to use later. Yeah. So I've set this up to be named so it's pretty clear that that's a direct map that this is for just general, all paragraphs. So if you look in the theme file, here's the preprocess function that actually uses those. We have all paragraphs, doesn't matter what kind, they're getting this library, which is the theme name and then the library name that's defined. If it's the bundle is multi-column, it gets this one. Otherwise, it gets this library. Or if it has a specific field with a value, then we put on this library. So that way, you don't, say you're giving your content editors the ability to set the background color of field. It's kind of messy if you're rendering the actual CSS value on each div when you're doing that. So I usually you have been in providing just a taxonomy terms that <coughs> give them a list that they can select brand colors and then from that list I give them the CSS just it gets attached that corresponds to those taxonomy terms which is that. So it's it works you can use CSS if directly if you're really needing to give them full control. But in, in, in line CSS yes, on the div. You can within Twig, but then you're mixing a, if you want to why is that button green? It's not supposed to be green. Oh look, the whole paragraph is green in, and that's not in my CSS properly because I didn't I didn't account for the inheritance that that inline CSS, which has way higher inheritance. So 
if you can use asset libraries, do. You can avoid it, but there's just use. You might as well use Drupal 8's features to best effect, not try and get around them unless you actually have to. Any other questions? In, in that example there, yes. I think I know the answer, but I just want to verify. Um, because you pointed out that you can also uh, attach CSS in the in the, uh, the Twig file. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing that you went with the preprocessor here because of the number of uh, uh, you know different yeah. cases. Yeah. Uh, rather than, and you probably don't have a bunch of Twig files for. No, I have. I'm inheriting the one paragraph twig file from the paragraph module. It applies to every paragraph type. And so you didn't attach, so you didn't, I guess the question, here's the question. When do you attach in a preprocessor? When do you attach in the twig file? How do you navigate that? Well, if you have, if you're already doing specific twig files for this node type, this paragraph type, and you don't have a proof process function for your node, you might as well attach it there because that's simpler. If you have a proof process and a twig, then you have two places to look, two places to think about. If you have to have both, well, it's a toss -up. then it kind of depends what do you like. Yeah. I personally, I alternate. I haven't yet figured out is there actually a good reason to do one or the other. I suspect that in the preprocess function is minusculely more performance, but I haven't actually done any testing. Better and performance? I would think so because one Just less function. The twig layers. Yeah. yeah, but I haven't tested it, so it's a, hunch. It's a l very limited hunch. If it is a performance difference, it's so far down there, you don't actually care about it. Yeah. You could rewrite almost any other code for better gains. Mm -hmm. Probably your ray walking will be more important than whether you're attaching it to one place or another. Mm -hmm. Because once it's attached, Drupal is fairly smart. Once you've attached it once, if you try and attach it again, there's no errors, it just knows that's already attached. So you don't actually you could attach it both places, but that would be messy because then, oh look, I've removed that library. It's still making the CSS still be there. Any other questions? I do have another. Um, the notion of the render function in Drupal 7. Yes. Um, my sense is that in Drupal 8, you just pass it a renderable array in the double curly braces. Yes. Is Already knows to render it? Yes. So Double curly there is no render function in Twig. There is a render function in Twig because there's a few cases that say you want to check if a field exists. So on a node, you would say content dot field name to access that field. That field may have an empty value, but the render array is pro propagated. Yeah. So it has a bunch of sub fields. If you do length or is set, it says true. So you can pre-render that field to another variable and say, did that field actually provide any data or did it render as an empty string? To do that... And so is it a filter? So it's a function, not a filter? It's a, well, twig filters is, how, is what they call functions. Functions, PHP functions are twig filters and vice versa. Versa, except that twig filters are limited. Doesn't twig have a notion of a, of a function where you're passing in an argument or an argument where you're like piping it into a, into a filter? Uh, filters can accept arguments. So filters are the equivalent of functions, but they're named differently. If you... So... Say this uh, here, if page header, say I'm providing it with data somewhere else or something is providing it with data, that means it's not an empty array, then it's going to still be printing all of this even if I don't have a page header. So what you could do is
render it to header, and then say, does that header exist? Of course, if you're doing this, then you're rendering your header twice now. This one doesn't affect you. This does not affect your DOM, your generated content, but it is rendering to that variable, so that's a waste of time. So you would then remove that and just render that same thing again. It's already pre-rendered that way. You're just printing out the rendered content. Do we still have the hide and the show functions? Not hide and show. What you have is there isn't a hide per se. There is without. Uh, the without what you have. So you would go I want to print the whole page in this header because I'm very weird, but I don't actually want to put the breadcrumb here. So you would just say, full page without breadcrumb. So that's how you give it arguments. It's not all the filters accept arguments. There's fairly good documentation on the Twig website and on Drupal. And is there a, um, a summary of the Drupal layer of Twig functions that Drupal adds to it, or do we just need to search the code base for that? There is a list of functions. Let's see, how do I escape this mode? Exit full screen. Uh, exit presentation, I think, is one. I don't know if it's the same thing. But. Okay, so, yes, there is a... If I can spell Drupal, anyways. Within the Drupal 8 documentation, here's the list of filters. So, you can do a lot with filters. You can also create your own filters. Creating your own filters, it's pretty easy. It's not something I've actually ever needed to do because I've either found the filters I needed or used preprocessed functions. I'm PHP as was my first backend language after Python. I'm comfortable in PHP. I'm happy to use a preprocessed function. If I was Working with a lot of people that were more theme oriented, didn't want to be using PHP, but were regularly saying, Can you make a function? Can you make a function? Then I might make pre process functions for them, but, <coughs> but then I might make, instead of a pre process function, I'd make a Twig filter that they could use instead. Twig filter does have one benefit over pre process function. It's easily reusable because you can use it in any template, whereas the preprocess function is only for that node type or paragraph. Yes, you can copy and paste the code, adjust it slightly, but you could also just make it usable for any render array by setting it up as a twig filter. Any more questions? Yes. Do you have any like, recommendations for uh, debugging or um, techniques for theming? Well, for debugging, Xdebug is great. It gives you everything without running out of memory. Whereas if you're doing var dump, you're going to run out of memory. Or you're going to have a browser page this long and that's kind of unreadable. Xdebug is my favorite. It integrates well with quite a few <laughs> editors. It doesn't work well on Windows, but, well, if you're on Windows, hey, I'm on Windows, this, because for some reason, this laptop never would dual boot. I wanted to dual boot with Ubuntu, but the Windows la system, subsystem Linux works pretty good, so it works for me. Would we also just do a quick example of that? Like, see what the content variable looks like with things to go Unfortunately, because I'm on Windows right now, I can't. But, uh, 
you can't easily uh, do xDebug directly in the twig. You can theoretically set it up, but the problem is, is that xDebug only works with PHP files. Twig gets, every time you change a twig file, it gets compiled into a PHP file within your files directory for your site. So you can then target xDebug on that PHP file, but that changes, the name of it changes every time you change your twig file. So that's not very nice. So what I do for running xDebug on a variable is I just use a preprocess function. Even if I don't need to use the preprocess function, I'm going to throw out this preprocess function, but just provides me a quick, easy way to debug that variable. I just set my breakpoint in that preprocess function, have all the variables available. Any more questions? Yes? Do you think we have time to go through like creating a basic view? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so creating a basic theme, would you like to use a generator or just hand code it? <coughs> okay. So, if you have a Drupal install ready, great. Usually, I put my themes in. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention the theme directory is slightly different. You still can use site-specific theme directory, uh, sites, all themes, but that's no longer the standard, or sites, all specific site name for a multi-site. Now, it's web root slash themes is your themes directory. You can have subdirectories in there. Common setup is have a contrib subdirectory and a custom subdirectory, and then any contrib themes in your contrib directory. That's how Composer sets it up if you're using the Drupal Composer stub project. So you would create a new directory. Let's see. The uh, directory name doesn't have to match your theme name, but just do it because if you are using Drupal project like if you put your theme onto Drupal.org and then download it, it will be in a folder that's the same name. So you might as well just do it. So you create eight a new file in that theme folder, custom theme.info.yml. If you're really good, you remember every key that you need to enter. Most people, they're not going to remember every key. A lot of people, you will just copy and paste. The absolutely required keys is core. And now I can't remember the rest of that. Which is why I usually, it's quicker to just copy and paste because Yep, not that one. So, you give it a name. The name does not have to match the theme machine name. The machine name is custom theme in this case. The name could be custom themey thing. It does have to say type and it does have to have a core. Everything else is optional, although if you don't have regions, it's not going to have of anywhere to print stuff, so you probably don't want that. You generally want to have regions. 
say we just want a header and content for this because it's a really simple theme. So you first key within the regions array is the machine name which has to be a valid PHP array name. So it can't have special characters. The actual name here, that's what shows up on your blocks admin page. It could be anything. Something short and simple is usually best And then you would create, yeah, let's see, templates. And make a the uh, templates folder. You see that this file is directly within the templates folder. <coughs> that gets messy fast if you have 50 templates you're going to be scrolling. So what you usually do is you have it s split up into base, node, content, paragraph folders with then the individual templates within those. There is no uh, requirement to have, say you're using Classy as its parent theme. It has those folders. There's no requirement to be using the same folder organization of your templates. The only thing that matters is the actual name of your template. So Classy has the folder block in its templates. You could have your block template just loose within templates, not templates block, block.html.twig. Well, it's uh, supposed to be break time. <gasps> Does anyone want to have a break or? a second to figure out what I'm saying next. <laughs> I thought I had more content there. That would, I thought that my content was going to take like an hour and a half and then my questions would be half an hour. But honestly, I miscalculated a little bit. Just a little bit. You know, 50% or so. <laughs> I recall when I asked it, to make sure you had that content. Yeah, well... <laughs> I think a walkthrough is good though. Yeah. Do you happen to have an example of your pre-process function for the paragraphs? Yes. Sorry. That looks like a good base to reuse for other paragraph types. Yeah. Is there any way you could post that somewhere? Oh yeah, can definitely. Okay. That'd yeah. Be great. Thank you. I was wondering how you're doing structuring your SAS too, if you're outputting it for like a paragraph type as a CSS file. Yeah. Or if you're doing like a global thing and... Yep. Yeah, uh, you can definitely show you that. So, what I have SAS wise is I have a bunch of folders of base stuff. Mm -hmm. All my base stuff is going into this one file which imports everything. Okay. Yeah. And then I have oh, there you go. this, which so import your variables it imports the variables. Okay. And then for my, I have set these up in my paragraph definitions that mm -hmm. this is my field name, and then I have a field on my multi-column paragraph type what number of columns do you want? Yeah. It's not necessarily going to render in that number of columns. If you select that two columns and it's really narrow, mm -hmm. like if you're on a 
phone is not going to listen to you saying two columns. Yeah. Because content editors may think it's a good idea to have that be two columns, but you don't really want it two columns on that phone. Mm -hmm. As soon as you switch down to mobile, pop it to one column. Mm -hmm. So I've got each. This is a fairly small theme. It's a 10 page website, it's not too complicated. Okay. Yeah, the, the structure makes sense. Because then you're outputting the yeah. CSS for that paragraph and, and calling it. So, yeah. So, this is pretty sparse, really, this CSS file. But, oh no. Uh -oh. Slightly loose code. So, with Drupal 8, my, I don't know if you were here yesterday for Mike's talk on performance. Yes. Yeah. Um, with Drupal 8, every, it's smart with the CSS and JS. It only puts it if you tell it to. So, if you do lots of sm small files, you get smaller size of page. All right. You can improve performance more by doing all those things that he said, but Drupal 8 performance is slightly better than Drupal 7 just off the bat. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. well thank you. That, that kind of clears up how, you're, how to get the CSS into the pre-process and pre -process be able to call it yeah. rather than you know, drill down in the SAS for it. Okay, thank yeah, you. I think, actually, I just have a specific question. Yes. So I'm looping over. Yeah, this content. So I'm trying to get the the iterator in there. Yeah. How can I pass the iterator into like the sub twig? The uh, which like the road up content yeah. is getting rendered here. Yeah. So I'd like to have that index available in order to name my IDs uniquely. Right. And is there a way to do that? Um. It's like in the parent. You know what the index is. Yes. I don't I don't think there is because this is just telling it to render that. What you would have to probably do is in a pre-process function loop over your content. Like in your pre-process mm -hmm. functions, just do a four inch on your rows, then each row dot content, add an extra key for index equals that right. key. Passive, it, so. It's not as nice, but I don't think there's a way to do that in Twig without doing a new, you could make a new filter, but... Well, that's what I was curious. I mean, can you set that row content, I think, is an entity. I mean, can you set it's a, a variable the render there or way. not? You can. I haven't tried to set, you might be able to, if you say, before trying to render it, you say set row dot content dot index equals index. Well, that doesn't work. I tried that. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't ever tried that. So uh, I was wondering if there's a I, method available yes, that, that like I, set or something. The thing is, within the twig file only affects that twig file. Like as the row dot content is already set. I think. I think. I've never tried to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, if I would try with just the pre-process function. I've done equivalent to that mm -hmm. before in view slideshow, adding the index for each slide. Yeah. But I never did that because that was how it was done in Drupal 7 where, and I was editing Drupal 8. I just did the same method. Sure. Yeah, and I can see that would work. It's just it's yeah. one of those, like, well, we're already in You already here, have the twig so. function. Can you do it without the pre-process? Yeah. I think it will be hard. I don't know how. Okay. Okay,
I think everyone else has gratefully ran away. <laughs> but I have future of a few people. Oh, oh, people are coming back. Not everyone's run away. Not that I blame you. Can I take it by the number of hot spot connections? I see that the network is working. The network is down, yeah. So for a really simple theme, you could override only one template if you wanted to, because that's all you needed to change from your base theme. That's really rare, but for example, the YMCA has a lot of a big base theme that a lot of their branches then use. Those branches actually don't want to do that much changes from that base theme. Their sub theme could be very small. So, for basic, basic theme, you need your theme info. With regions, you just Description and everything is also unnecessary. It's great to have. If you're going to publish it on Drupal.org, really put the description in. If you're using it on your own site, eh. It's nice to know what you were thinking, but it's not actually needed. And then the libraries, as we were talking about earlier, is defined in your theme name, libraries.yml. And then that CSS file is in the, your theme folder right here. So this theme, it does basically nothing right now. Make sure that your base theme is actually a theme that that site has or it's going to mess up because it's looking for data that doesn't exist. So that very simple theme, it does basically nothing except for set a light blue background on some areas. And it shows up in the uninstalled themes. To use it, install and set default. But now I've only defined the two regions in that theme, which is way less than the regions that were in that old theme that it had. 
So your block layout is now totally messed up. So if you're changing the region names, it will put everything in your regions that you give it and then you'll probably have to adjust it because your new regions are different than your old regions. And honestly, that basic theme, it looks pretty bad because it has no data in it. So, any questions? Any specific t features that you want to question me or, uh, or help getting a function to work? Then I think uh, this is pretty early. And I'm going to have to say I've done my best, but I really should have analyzed my timing better and talked a lot slower or made a few more practices and realized that I did not have enough content yet. So, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you very much.